well. Um, and I'll make a brief introduction to Michael. Uh, as brief as that introduction can be with such a talented presenter that we, we're fortunate to have with us uh, today. Um, Michael, first of all, a very, very warm, warm welcome. Uh, the title is very, very exciting. What survives financial Armageddon, central bank digital currencies, Bitcoin, gold, or crypto cockroaches? So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, a warm welcome to the members of the Blockchain Forum, as well as uh, some of our students from our Masters in Digital Transformation. Um, I, in introducing Michael, I, I'll say just a couple of things, and I'll put a hyperlink to his uh, rich CV, um, and you can find out more about his work. He has co-founded Zien, which, which is a, a think tank in the city of London. Uh, Michael has been educated at Harvard University, Trinity, Trinity College Dublin, and also um, did his PhD at the London School of Economics, which is where we've met. Um, he, in creating Zien, he's created a number of uh, additional intellectual ventures in the space between finance and technology, from long finance, the London Accord, the Global Intellectual Property Index, and so on. He, he's developed a hundred million pound business within the UK Ministry of Defense uh, and, and with many other business uh, accolades, but also uh, intellectual accolades as well. Uh, he's alderman for Broad Street Ward Club and uh, of the City of London Corporation. And last but not least, amongst some of the highlights that I've, uh, I've noted, uh, he's Sheriff of the City of London. Uh, now, that's an interesting title. Um, nobody sought the Sheriff, nobody sought the Deputy. We've got the Sheriff with us. Michael, uh, a very warm welcome and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Dionysus. And uh, I would like to say it's a delight to be here, especially with the Blockchain Forum, because today I am going to be trying to split the difference on my enthusiasm for blockchain decentralized ledger technology or smart ledgers, as I prefer, prefer to refer to them, uh, versus uh, my not particularly uh, warm response whatsoever to cryptocurrencies. And I hope that it sparks some kind of debate. Uh, it's going to be a little intimidating because both Dionysus and I have uh, Professor Ian Angel overlooking us uh, over our shoulders here. So it's a bit, a bit uh, as, as our thesis advisor, but I'll try and have a go. And I know that we'll have a fairly rich discussion. Um, the title today was chosen when Dionysus and I thought to ourselves, how, how can we make this sound interesting? And I think it was Dionysus who raised Armageddon. Uh, and one of the things that's constantly been on my mind is how apt is the comparison between the gold bug and the uh, crypto market. And so I think we can explore that and uh, see, see where we go from there. As Dionysus said, I run a firm in the city of London called Zien. We're famous for a few things, uh, but probably and uh, one of the smallest areas that we do is we run three indices, the Global Financial Centers Index, the Smart Centers Index, and the Global Green Finance Index. If anything is relevant to this though today, it's probably the fact that we do have a fairly good idea of what's going on globally in about 115 centers around the world. And without a doubt, everybody is excited about cryptocurrencies, central bank digital currencies, and crypto assets. Now, I'll be referring to a lot of research that we have done, and we have done a significant amount of research in this area, uh, some 40 plus uh, reports and some of the most cited reports in the sector. Um, uh, and they're all free and available online. I just draw your attention to a report on the bottom right that I pulled out slightly. That was a report that we did uh, during 2010 and 11 for the City of London Corporation. It was called Capacity, Trade and Credit. What's intriguing about that report, it was the first report where we mentioned Bitcoin, probably one of the very first reports uh, at all in the City of London on Bitcoin and done by what is effectively uh, the, the, the entity with local authority powers in the city. So uh, vastly ahead of later blockchain developments in the UK government, which sort of came in around 2006 when people started to pay attention. But in the city, there's been intense interest in what this might mean for trade and credit. And therefore we've given this a, a fair amount of thought. 
So what would the, the outline that I'd like to cover today? Well, I think it's important to establish a common background about money, and I'll give a certain specific definitions of it, which I hope are helpful. I then want to turn to gold, look at some of the cryptocurrency myths and legends, uh, look at central bank digital currencies, and then have some musings that we can discuss uh, at the end. So where do we start? Well, money is a, an interesting topic. Uh, it's an interesting topic because it's pervasive, because it motivates us, becomes a, because it comes with huge emotional attachments. Uh, one of the best uh, books on the subject, in my opinion, is James Booken. He wrote a book uh, called Frozen Desire, and he speaks uh, anthropologically about a whole variety of ways of looking at money. But I need to give us a definition today. And the definition I'm going to give looks at first glance a bit basic, but I think contains a richness to it. So the definition is money is a technology communities use to trade debts across space and time. Hmm. Interesting. Well, the funny bit is that anthropologists do have a fairly specific meaning for a community. And a community in anthropological terms is a group of people who are prepared to be indebted to one another. So I am not a member of the blockchain forum community, but I might be doing this presentation in hopes that one of you would present to one of my communities. And the minute we start to establish these trading relationships, we actually form a community. So anthropologists don't see community as a soft, fuzzy, warm, friendly word at all in the way the politicians might mean it. They see it as very much a network of indebtedness. Now, that network of indebtedness can be uh, social indebtedness. So uh, you owe me a wife and I want your younger daughter or something. And in representation of that, I have three brass bands or all sorts of things. So there are various forms of indebtedness other than what we might think about as economic indebtedness. And again, to anthropologists, uh, it's very rare that you would find anything approaching money in a single village. As you move to multiple villages, sort of at the tribal level, you'll begin to see uh, the machinations of some type of social currency, but those tend to take unusual forms that we in our modern Western guys like to laugh at, but the face stones of Yap or the cowrie shells of the North Americans, because these are social monies. Uh, but then as you move up to the economic level, that's typically where you move outside of your tribe, things get kind of interesting. And one of the first that uh, arose at that level was gold. And we'll come on to that next. But just ask you to remember this, money is a technology, in my opinion, and communities use this technology to trade their debts across space and time. So what about gold? Well, uh, gold's an interesting one. If you start digging into the history of gold, um, it really is intimately related to Midas and the Lydians. And Midas and the Lydians around 600 BC were the first people to believe that gold was a useful means of establishing value. Uh, prior to that, there had been other coinages, but they'd largely been forced. Um, after, after gold, silver comes in, into play. And of course, it was Alexander the Great who was raging across uh, in the fourth century BC, raging across uh, Asia Minor, who establishes uh, the bimetallic system. And gold and silver have sort of coexisted. But uh, gold is a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a useful monetary uh, element it, it is interesting because Prior to 600 BC, as much as anthropologists can find out, gold was not seen as a particularly valuable element. It was seen as pretty, but so was lapis lazuli and so were other things. And so this primacy of gold comes largely because King Midas decides to stamp his head upon it. Um, and this then becomes effectively the de facto currency uh, for other currencies, the international standard, if you will. Uh, and so in many senses, there was a gold standard long before the 19th century when people started talking about it. It had already become a bit of a de facto standard. Now, if we look at gold, uh, the price over time here, um, I've got a chart uh, going back uh, to the first date there on the very left is uh, 1968 when it's uh, trading at $35. Uh, but in fact, what we're seeing here on, the, on this chart is that, oops, is that chart still there, by the way, Dionysus? Yes, yes, I can see that. Uh, Zoom has decided that uh, finding participants is more important than the diagram. Anyway, we're back under control here. Yep, um, and then you can look at the you know the recent prices, which have been uh, touching uh, 2,000, 2000 uh, uh, pounds. So the, the price has been fluctuating for some time, uh, largely, largely on a growth streak. Um, but if I was to contrast that graph with 
a graph of the value of purchasing power of either the pound or the dollar. Uh, in fact, uh, gold has not has failed to keep pace. Now, nevertheless, and I, by the way, it's important probably for me to note in full disclosure, I have sat on the boards of two gold companies. So it's not that I have a, a, a down on gold. Uh, people do wish to purchase it and we are happy to mine it. Um, I also have a reasonable amount of my assets in gold, um, uh, not the majority by any means. And that's largely because gold has been seen as an inflation hedge uh, because it's physically backed. Um, it's got this long-term social element that there's a security of valuable value. And of course, gold is pretty much well nigh indestructible, although it is easily stolen. Um, it's a simple uh, element, a simple commodity, and simple in some way because it has no particular commercial use whatsoever. Um, but over time, it has had, frankly, terrible returns. So you use it really because you're able to add to your portfolio diversification and you get an inflationary hedge. Uh, and so a lot of uh, investors would consider it to be a reasonably useful tool uh, for those purposes, but it's not considered to be a particularly good investment. So um, when, when we look at gold in that way, it, it, you begin to realize that uh, it's a minor element. We'll come on to the scale of it in a minute. But one of the things about gold, which is intriguing to me, is all of the gold ever mined, all of the gold ever mined would fit into a cube 21 meters uh, on each of three sides. So it's, you know, it would fit handily inside a, a swimming pool, an Olympic size swimming pool anyway. There's really not that much of it around. Now, the next level we want to look at is that, of course, but we've now got these new cryptocurrencies. Now, cryptocurrencies, this group will know a lot about, um, probably about how, how they work, but I want to cover three things that bother me about them. You know, is this brand new and what's it achieving? Uh, what are the economies, uh, sorry, what are the economics and speed uh, issues here? And finally, is this stuff any good for payments? Uh, to do so, I'll just have a quick stop on, um, if I can, on terminology. The terminology is evolving. Um, and you know, remember that a lot of people use blockchain to refer colloquially to, you know, that cryptocurrency stuff. Well, blockchain is strictly just a data structure. Um, you could talk about a larger ecosystem. We've seen the rise of uh, distributed ledger or distributed ledger, ledger technology. Um, the blockchain definition there is taken uh, from the Bitcoin data, uh, Bitcoin site, a transaction database shared by all nodes participating in a system based on the Bitcoin protocol. So uh, a bit circular there, but nevertheless, it, it is based on a blockchain and then there's a, a corresponding protocol on top of it. Of course, much of the excitement uh, intellectually in the cryptocurrency space has uh, since 2009 when Bitcoin was launched really been overtaken by Ethereum. And so Ethereum was launched in August 2015. And at this point, the excitement was about smart contracts. Now, smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. They're simply pieces of code. And I can stick a piece of that code into uh, a ledger uh, online, into a distributed ledger, and then I can execute that code at some point in the future. For those of you of a computing bent, this is effectively what Lisp did at MIT in 1958. So uh, this turns, I think, quite nicely to the myth that one myth I'd like to debunk, which is that this stuff is all new. Um, I took on a researcher from Imperial, and after I got this young fellow to realize that uh, hashes are effectively the same thing as checksums, he started running through the literature and he turned up this really interesting bit here. Uh, so Henry uh, and I wrote a paper called uh, Smart Ledger Patents and, and Prior Smarts. This is effectively a 1978 uh, patent filed in 1976 by IBM for, are you ready for it? A blockchain. So there you have it. They're not new. And I know they're not new because in 1977, I had a discussion, oh, sorry, right, in early 1978, I had a discussion at Harvard with Vince Cerf and others about how we would go about creating an internet of record. And we immediately said we would record a long checksum of what had been transmitted. But of course, long checksums or hashes are about 256 bytes. And in those days, I was trying to stick a parabolic guidance system into 4K of code. So 16 hashes would have taken up all of my memory. Um, and so we knew the answer, but it, it really, the economics didn't fly. We needed to have 
a lot more uh, processing speed. Uh, we needed a lot more storage. And frankly, we needed the connectivity that justified the use case in the first place. Um, but um, we did go on at CN to build our first blockchain. You can read about it in the Financial Times. And that was in 1995. Um, so again, not new. And there were other uh, activities out there. Uh, on the left, you see locks and clocks. Uh, these were uh, Stanford University projects still going uh, to look at uh, storing scientific and other works in a way that they couldn't be in any way tampered with and that there was proof of their existence at the time and they were time stamped, again, using uh, very much decentralized ledger technology. And very relevant uh, to today, uh, on the right, I've got a picture of something called eGold. eGold existed, I think, from memory from about 1996 until 2009, when it was effectively shut down by the American authorities who made all sorts of allegations against it. The litigation dragged on for years. And in fact, nobody in eGold was ever charged with any crime or anything else. The US authorities were just anxious to ensure that some gold operations trading across American soil were shut down and how they did it didn't seem to bother them. Um, so uh, there's nothing new. Well, the second bit is that uh, myth I'd like to dispel is that economics don't matter. This is probably the most fundamental uh, thing I'd like to get around. Um, and I'll start really on, on two elements. So the first is just the, the pure economics of, of Bitcoin. It is grotesquely expensive to process. Uh, now, I doubt that any of you haven't come across some of these comparisons, um, which is that, you know, over the course of the year, uh, Bitcoin consumes effectively the energy consumption of the Netherlands. Or another thing that a single Bitcoin transaction footprint is equivalent to the footprint of 1.2 million visa transactions or 90,000 hours of watching YouTube or the average uh, U.S. household power usage over 40 days. So you're talking here about a grotesquely inefficient uh, system. And I say grotesquely inefficient. Uh, I'm conscious that a lot of people come back and say, well, the cash system is grotesquely inefficient too. I, I'm not saying that's not true, uh, but we'll come on to the, the cost per transaction is the big issue here. Uh, and second thing a number of people assert is that, uh, is that uh, Bitcoin is using mostly green energy because they don't know where the energy is coming from. But of course, the green energy is only displaced green energy that somebody else would have used. So that doesn't really get, get one very far. Um, but let's have a look now at the second element of the speed. Well, the speed argument is the one that really gets me going here. So let's just remind ourselves of what our volumes are. Bitcoin can handle about seven transactions a second if everything's going perfectly. Ethereum about 30. A blockchain structure such as we use or smart ledger structure without the coins on it can process anywhere from 2000 to 100,000 TPS, just depending on the configuration. The cost per transaction, when looked at either in monetary terms or energy terms, comes out at approximately $20 per transaction. So, you know, just, just imagine you walk into your local news agent to buy a uh, newspaper. You see a sign on the wall that says, we, you know, Bitcoin accepted here, uh, which sounds really, really good. Uh, you hand your Bitcoin wallet over and while you're waiting, 10 minutes to get out the door because he won't let you out until the transaction clears. Uh, you've just spent uh, you know, $20 purchasing your $1 or $2 newspaper. So this doesn't fly. Uh, and Ethereum is better. Well, it's better, but it's still not, still not looking very, very good. Uh, and you can see some of the comparisons down there at the bottom. It is a grotesquely inefficient system. Arguably, uh, I'm not an anti the experiment that was Bitcoin. I am an admirer of the consensus mechanism that was built, but it is a bit of a sorcerer's apprentice experiment that's gone wrong if you think you're going to use it. And I'll conclude by just looking at payments. So this is a picture of Wembley Stadium. Okay, uh, Wembley Stadium holds about 90,000 people. Uh, that means, uh, you know, people go to the stadium and they purchase a ticket on the top right. Uh, they decide to get a beer and a, and a sausage. Uh, and then maybe they want to buy a strip uh, to take home to the kids as a souvenir. So that's four transactions. Well, you know, we're now talking about uh, three, <laughs> 360,000 transactions. Well, Bitcoin's entire capacity in a 24-hour period 
is 350,000 transactions. So we all go to the stadium, all 90,000 of us. We purchase four things. We spend 24 hours in a bit at the stadium making those purchases while we all sit around waiting. Oh, and by the way, nobody else in the world can process anything. So that doesn't really strike me as a payment system. Uh, and we'll come on to that in a minute. And the reason behind all this is that the structure that's behind cryptocurrency specifically is one where they, they are trying to have absolutely no central third party. And when you wish to have absolutely no central third party, the cost of processing effectively goes through the roof. And uh, so you can see at the top right, if I trust the Bank of England, if I trust Visa, if I trust somebody at the center, I can run a high speed efficient central database. If I trust nobody on the bottom left, uh, then I will get to these outrageous processing costs. But that's oddly not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about financial Armageddon and who's going to win. Well, you know, I think it's important, therefore, to kind of look at the financials behind it. Um, Herbert Simon said, you know, what information consumes is rather obvious. Uh, well, what money consumes is rather obvious. It consumes attention. Nobody cared about blockchain, not a hoot, until they thought there was heaps of money to be made out of cryptocurrencies. So for that, in some ways, I'm thankful. Distributed ledger technology has gotten a boost by proving its ability to operate in extremely harsh conditions, which is lots of people trying to make money and hack the system. So we look at it here, but I think there are a couple of things you can look at as well. The first is until this very, very recent boom, if we'd been holding uh, this talk uh, sometime up until perhaps uh, last November, I would have shown a chart like this and said, this stuff isn't gonna take over the world. If this is so world beating, one wants to see an exponential chart. Now we have seen starting late last year and continuing roughly until now, a, a second boom that is certainly been larger than the one that we experienced in the peaks around January, 2018. But again, one would like to see if this is truly going to take over the world, a really uh, vertical type of exponential chart and not something as boring as this. But I think there's another point that's uh, worth, worth making is the, the so-called outrageous success of Bitcoin puts it as approximately 0.3% uh, of total global wealth or all cryptocurrencies together, about 0.6%. And as I mentioned earlier, all the gold ever mined, um, it sounds crazy that you can actually fit it into 21 meters square, uh, but is, you know, 197,000 tons. Uh, and at the current value of all that, yeah, cryptocurrencies aren't doing badly. I mean, you, you are up against a two and a half uh, millennium old technology of gold, but, uh, but this new technology um, hasn't subsumed it correct, uh, sorry, completely by any means. And so running at 17% or about eight and a half percent of the total value of gold over all time. This is a, one of the charts I keep a, a close eye upon. And what it shows is a zero to 100%. So from the bottom at zero and to the top is 100%. And it shows the share of all of the various cryptocurrencies that are registered um, out there on coin markets, which is frankly everybody. Um, what you'll see uh, on that chart is that large yellow area shows that, uh, and I've gone back here to uh, 2013. So from 2013 until 2017, about the middle of the chart, you can see that Bitcoin is over 80% of the market. Uh, then we see a proliferation of other cryptocurrencies, but principally Ethereum, I hasten to add. And then we see again that enormous spike in 2018 and Bitcoin goes down below 50% of the market. And in fact, at the very highest day, uh, Bitcoin was running at around uh, one third of the market and all the other cryptocurrencies together were running at two thirds. Well, we can then see the decline in all the other cryptocurrencies. And even during this current boom, Bitcoin is running at 50% of the market. I just want to put this in, a, in an interesting perspective, though. All these newfangled cryptocurrencies that have come out were supposedly about innovation, about new things coming out. And actually, the granddaddy of them all, January 2009, uh, Bitcoin, is still thumping them. So all of these other cryptocurrencies haven't made any progress over the last three to four years. They've actually lost market share. So, there, so we're really talking about the oldest one of all. 
Um, and, I, and I find that a, a particularly intriguing point that uh, the, the new ones haven't, haven't really done that well. And what does that mean? Well, it, it arguably means that I do think Bitcoin does bear some resemblance to gold. Uh, people are taking the oldest one because they'd like to hang into it. Uh, and they, they see it as part of portfolio diversification, um, but they're certainly not betting the house on it. Well, we need to turn then uh, to the last of our trio. Well, what about central bank digital currencies? And here, um, there's a lot of bunkum uh, spoken about. A friend of mine, Johnny Fry, is a nice guy. He writes a weekly newsletter on blockchain. But what I have noticed is over the years, um, anything that would have used a database is now called blockchain to Johnny. Uh, so if, you know, when he talks about Maersk and IBM are going to be uh, using a blockchain, well, are they really? What they're actually doing is they're doing independent time stamping of a database to a third party source. And if I was to say to you, you know, it's amazing. Maersk is tracking shipping all over the world. And you know what they're doing? They're using a database. You would laugh me out of court. You'd say, well, of course they're using a database, you idiot. What else do you think they would be doing? Well, all they're doing now is using a database and they've attached to it a time stamping engine. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing as well in, in many of the promotions on cryptocurrencies. They say, well, central banks are going for cryptocurrencies as well. Uh, well, most emphatically, central bank digital currencies are not cryptocurrencies uh, for a variety of very obvious reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, they have a central third party. Uh, the second is that they will have no consensus mechanism. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with they might, they might just uh, use a blockchain. Uh, if you'd like to explore this in some detail, I, I personally think this uh, BIS report uh, that came out in 2017 is a pretty good analysis and taxonomy of money in the round. Um, but uh, let's, let's proceed. So what's going to happen when the pixie dust settles? Well, the first thing is, it is not necessarily blockchain for central bank digital currencies. And in fact, the Swedish Reichsbank uh, said, are, are you insane? Uh, pretty close to it. We would not use something like that. The Chinese government is not using blockchain for its central bank digital currency. And the Bank of England has softly tried to explain to people that it doesn't see the advantage of using a blockchain because it is a central third party. So if we go digital, that's great. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it from a logical perspective, if you're a central bank in a highly political environment and you have your own ledger, and that ledger says that uh, you know we owe Dionysus Demetus 100 pounds, that's, that's what we've got on our ledger, and we, meanwhile, are also independently stamping into some open and transparent blockchain with all the uh, dangers that it has. What do you do when there's a conflict between the two? Are you going to say we, the central bank, are wrong? Right? And why are you doing that? Well, I'm putting it onto an independent blockchain to increase trust. Well, trust is a slippery word. I don't think you're putting it onto an independent blockchain to increase trust. In fact, you don't need to to do that because nobody has any choice but to trust you. Because what, because what we do when we trade uh, fiat currencies uh, or, or normal central bank currencies, we're trading tax credits. And trust me, if you, the government says that you owe them tax monies and it's got tax credits for those monies, that's the authoritative owner of it, not some independent blockchain uh, that is disputing it. A second area you've got to think about is privacy. Uh, this is, I think, a more interesting area for discussion. I have no particularly strong views, uh, but the Chinese are, are clearly looking at uh, some type of semi-anonymity, which means basically when they need to get in, they can, which therefore means they can always get in, which means they may be looking all the time, they're just not telling you. Uh, and we need to think through how that might work in Western societies. A third element to all of this, of course, uh, which the, <laughs> I find this amusing, the Swedish banking industry woke up to only earlier this year. Um, I had written on this and it had actually been up twice in Stockholm telling them that they really ought to pay attention to what their central bank was doing. People in Sweden are now going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I have a direct account of my own with the Swedish central bank, with the Reichsbank, why do I need to have an account with a Swedish bank? What does that give me? I've got, I've got the best bank account of all, the, the one with the central government. So why do I need a separate account? Well, the reason you need that separate account, uh, they would explain to you, is if you don't give us the money, we can't lend more than we have on the books. 
because that's how fractional reserve banking works. So a debate began in Sweden earlier this year, which was presaged, uh, which is broadly, uh, a lot of sort of thinking citizens are saying, why do we give banks this ability to lend 12 to 14 times what they have on the books? Isn't this the cause of the banking crises that we had? Um, and maybe if we were to remove that from them, then we wouldn't have banking crises and maybe we should be banking directly with the central bank. So uh, interesting problems arising there. And I think the same thing would happen here in the UK. Uh, the final thing, which is is just, uh, we I think you're all fairly familiar with uh, Godwin's uh, uh, Godwin's uh, law, uh, which states effectively that all uh, antagonistic conversations on the internet end with somebody accusing somebody else of being a Nazi. Um, Michael Minelli's law is that any discussion on economics and currencies tends to lead to some kind of new taxation. And I, I, th I think people haven't quite thought through how much a cryptocurrency, sorry, oops, there I fell into it myself, how much a CBDC uh, would allow a government to institute taxation as quickly as it wanted. So I've suddenly decided that I wish to tax all transactions on fur tomorrow morning by 25%. There's very little stopping me. Uh, there's no need to fill in forms or anything else like that. It can really be done at a switch of a programming switch. Uh, one of my favorites, which I gave in testimony to the House of Lords about six years ago, was uh, if you really hate London, uh, all the rest of the country uh, we're told down here hates us. Well, super, why don't you have the Trafalgar Square tax, which approaches 100% as you get to Nelson's column. Uh, and that would actually force people outside. So, you know, if you're out in the Outer Hebrides, you pay 1%, but if you're trying to buy a newspaper in Trafalgar Square, you're paying 99.9%. Uh, there you go. But all of these things are possible. And that in many ways, I think is extremely frightening. Uh, but we can come on to some of those discussions. So let's try and pull this together. Um, oops, let's try and pull it together. Um, I, I have always been a fan of uh, William Stanley Jevons' uh, little couplet you know, money is a matter of functions for a medium, a measure, a standard, a store. And I thought I'd sort of uh, try and uh, pull this together on that. Uh, despite this 19th century, you know, sort of aphorism, it does really work. Um, so the first thing is the function of medium, you know, by which he means, is it a medium of exchange? Does it have wide acceptability? Will people easily give up one thing for it? Well, crypto is quite poor. Um, you, know, you don't see many signs saying Bitcoin accepted here. In fact, you wouldn't remark upon them if they weren't so rare. I don't think uh, people put much outside of their shops these days saying, you know, money accepted here. Uh, although, to be fair, we are seeing people who are card only or cash only. Uh, gold is also poor. Try and walk out, try and walk into any shop with a bar of gold. Uh, and of course, they'll want to have it assay. They'll want all sorts of things. It's not easy to use. Um, a central bank digital currency, though, would be good. It would look, frankly, almost identical to what we're doing today with cards. So what about a measure? Well, a measure is, uh, to some degree, uh, one of the more subtle points uh, that Jevons makes. You're looking here at, is it fungible? In other words, can I pay in portions of it? So what happens if I have, you tell me something's 100 pounds, and I say to you, no, 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 I'll pay 95. We have to, we have, to have an ability to to change that. And crypto is not bad at that. You can split crypto up. Gold is extremely poor because you've got to cut the gold or remelt it or re reform it. And a CBDC would be good. Uh, what about a standard? Well, a standard requires some degree of stability that I can look at something and guess what it might cost. So I, I look at selling you a table and you look at it and say, well, that used table is probably worth about 50 pounds. We're, we're using that to estimate things. Uh, and that doesn't work when you're in a regime where the value is fluctuating so wildly as it is in crypto. Um, and it is, of course, also fluctuating relatively wildly in gold, although some there are some arguments that over the long term, gold is a reasonably good store of value. Uh, sorry, not good, sorry, a good measure of value. And of course, uh, digital currencies or fiat currencies are conventionally what we do. Uh, so you expect that a pint of milk costs you one pound thirty-five, and you expect it to cost one pound thirty-five tomorrow, uh, not four pounds seventy or three p. You don't want that type of volatility there on the standard. And finally, on the store, well, you know, how how good is it at future proofing? Well, I, I'm no fan of uh, of fiat currencies as an area 
for holding your cash, although arguably uh, it hasn't been too bad over the last uh, over the last decade with interest rates running at zero percent. Uh, holding on to cash is is interesting, but it doesn't make it a good investment. Gold has been adequate, uh, but crypto has been extremely poor. And then when we get to the final thing, ah, but real money. Well, do recall that real, real, is Spanish for royal. In other words, that real money is sovereign money, and sovereign money is tax money. So here we go again in a, in a, in a great loop. Um, I think when we're looking at CBDCs, I have great faith in the government taxing me there will be future taxation and therefore I will need to find CBDC to pay my taxes. So I think that that is very strongly backed. One of my great thought experiments in this space is um, money is a technology communities use to trade debts across space and time. Well, by all means, uh, tell Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs you're not feeling a member of the British community this year and you'll pay your taxes when you feel like it. You'll see how well backed the British currency is. Sooner or later, if you persist in this behavior, people will be knocking at your door with handcuffs. You will be taken. The system is actually backed by courts, by lawyers, by accountants, by tax inspectors, et cetera. Uh, and so it's a very backed system. Gold, well, it's a physical bar of inert metal. You're welcome to it. There is backing there. But crypto, crypto has been the hardest of all to figure out what's backing it. There's no necessarily strong community. You can't identify the community. You can make assertions that it's a libertarian group of people or something, but there's no defined group, uh, no geographic boundaries to it. Uh, I think one of the most insane things I ever saw was JP Morgan talking about the value of the historic energy in the system. They wrote, wrote an entire research report on that. But as my father once told me when I was a young fellow, you know, if, Sunk costs are sunk costs on. That's, that's, that's all they are, absolutely sunk. So um, to the exam question, financial Armageddon. Well, we probably ought to define Armageddon and I'm not gonna go back to the Bible and, <laughs> and other things, but you know, in case of gold, gold could probably survive anything, even nuclear warfare. You might have some slightly irradiated stuff. Um, crypto, well, crypto might well suffer from something like a Carrington event but it does have a strong cockroach capability. It will probably be there uh, so long as there's some set of servers running somewhere with some power. Uh, that's one of the beauties of the system. It's uh, based on the, the internet decentralization. It's just another layer up. And so long as the internet can survive nuclear warfare, fine. Carrington events, uh, you know, massive uh, solar ejections, maybe, maybe slightly different. Um, but I think when we talk about CBDCs, we have to add something else and that's this concept of an economic meltdown. Um, now this has been uh, something, uh, gold bugs are, their gold bugs are produced with great regularity every week or month, the same regurgitated reports that they have for the last 50 years that since Richard Nixon left the gold standard, all of the, all of the, um, all of the uh, Western financial systems are due to crash. And it may well be true, uh, but it, it, it hasn't happened yet. So we, we need to look at economic meltdown. Uh, of course, at this time, people are talking uh, quite seriously about the amount of debt that's been in, uh, encumbering governments due to the pandemic, and that that too will cause hyperinflation and an economic meltdown. But in a sense, this comes back to what should you be doing? Well, what you should be doing is going back to some of the very first principles, which is diversification. So I said that I have some gold. I also have a little bit of crypto. Um, uh, but I'm not counting on either to displace payments uh, and I'm not counting on either to make me money. I'm just doing that for economic diversification. So why am I excited about it? Well, I thought I'd just end on a couple of slides. What does excite me uh, very much in this space isn't the crypto, it's the blockchain or the DLT or the smart ledger. And that's because ledgers are everywhere and it's been the defining element of civilization having communities trying to trade debts of various forms through their ledger and not all uh, debts are financial as i said at the very beginning and so i'm very excited about people trading research reports through these types of systems uh, trading playing cards all sorts of things that people are doing we're going to see i think a, a nice explosion of systems and i, I wouldn't call them trust systems but authoritatively, independently timestamped systems. And it goes back to that conversation that I had in 78. Uh, what we were doing back then was we had TCP IP, you know, we had the Internet of Communications, but we didn't have the Internet of Record. 
and we're, we're inserting effectively uh, that internet of record layer uh, in, into our internet stacks. And I'm anticipating as well that the application areas that are gonna be much, much bigger than crypto are ones that you've probably heard about before, but we were writing reports on them seven or eight years ago. Uh, and it's very much about identities, uh, document exchanges of various types uh, and agreements. And that we'll be seeing a lot of uh, things being placed through these systems, um, but it won't necessarily be money. Uh, and, it, and it certainly won't be people using cryptocurrency on some regular basis for payments. So I'll pause there, Dionysus, if that's okay. And maybe we can have some discussion. I hope that was sort of what you were after. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation uh, and a fascinating set of issues from the grotesquely inefficient system of Bitcoin down to the pixie dust of the central bank digital currencies. I was very intrigued with the, um, it's the Trafalgar Square uh, option where you can have geolocation-based crypto taxation. That would be a wonderful, wonderful idea. <laughs> Perhaps we can find some variant of this. I've put a note in the in the chat box on the Financial Services Club uh, that you're hosting, and hopefully uh, people will sign up to that as well. It's a fascinating club. Uh, we've got 14 to 15 minutes for questions because Michael, I, I'm sure those of you that know him know that he's very, very busy and he's hosting another uh, webinar later on. So keep your questions brief and to the point instead of making statements. Uh, so we can have a very, very quick, rapid round of, of Q&A. And the floor is open. Could I start? Um, given the time it takes for a, a Bitcoin transaction, uh, what do you see the equivalent of a run on Bitcoin? Uh, because if you can't get immediate sale of your, of your coinage, then everyone will want to sell and sell and sell. And the time of the exchange is such that the price would, cl would crash. Uh, uh, Ian, that's an that's a excellent piece of insight. Um, uh, uh, several people have had a go at trying to analyze whether or not the timing delays have, have exacerbated some of these liquidity issues. Um, and I don't have the figures to hand, but there have been uh, occasions where Bitcoin has taken many, many hours uh, to, to clear. I think there's another point further to this, which is unlike um, something like the taxation system or the physically backed gold, there's probably a collapse point in Bitcoin where it almost can't recover because it, it needs people to want to transact with each other. And the minute that they're all racing for the exit, it, it becomes particularly acute as, as they try and, and sell. And a final point, which is, is also, I think, quite interesting. Uh, people talk about the consensus mechanism and other things, but they, they don't actually record anywhere the rejected transactions. And so it's very, very difficult to get a handle on what transactions are being put into the system that haven't been cleared uh, and, and for what reason. They only record the authoritative blocks as, as they arrive. So there's a lot out there um, to go on that. But I think that's a that would be a great area for research would be to look at uh, the timing delays and whether or not that had, had in some ways affected the liquidity. Thank you, Michael. Further questions from Michael? Well, if there's nobody else saying, I, I, I'm interested in, in the Scotch Nats uh, claim that uh, they may have to introduce their own currency north of the border on independence. Uh, if that, could that be a cryptocurrency? And um, I, I find the whole notion of the Scottish using, using sterling when it's not sterling, because they're independent, uh, uh, a formula for enormous uh, disruption, particularly north of the border. Mm. Well, one of the interesting things is that there was a lot of chatter about we won't let them use sterling. And in fact, um, one, uh, England couldn't stop them. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's been done in many other cases, Hong Kong, et cetera. Secondly, the system is almost ideally set up for separation in that uh, the continued use of sterling doesn't cause a problem. All the Scottish notes are backed and they have their own issuance system. 
Um, I think this takes. Yes, but what happens if all the Scottish banks issuing the notes are in England, not in Scotland? Um, like the, the Royal Bank of Scotland says it's going to go to London on independence. Well, uh, you, you'll see. You'll see. One of the funniest things is the Scottish banks make money on the arbitrage difference overnight between the between the currency that's on issue and what they have to hold at the Bank of England. Um, that's faded away quite a bit because the interest rates are so low. But if interest rates rose. Uh, to back into sort of uh, three, four, five percent levels, they, they wouldn't want to cut their own noses off. They'd be making too much money on it. Uh -huh. But then, like can, can, we can have I? The sorry, problem. sorry, the problem, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but we've, we're going to run out of time. Of course, have you got other questions? questions? Please, somebody yeah. else jumps um, in here. I see Arthur has raised his hand, and then after Arthur, Gerprit has also raised his hand. So, Arthur, please go next. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. T. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one, obviously related to Bitcoin. So once all 21 million of them are mined, what's next for Bitcoin? Well, the important thing there is that uh, Bitcoin has a much unremarked upon uh, transaction spread. Um, and so to get people to mine, they're going to have to take a cut on every transaction. And those transaction spreads, which do exist and, uh, and are paid, We'll, we'll have to grow to cover the fact that at the moment, people are quite happy to do the mining just to get a coin. So uh, we'll see the transaction spreads grow. Uh, so a lot of people think that that $20 uh, transaction that I've been speaking about uh, might increase markedly, um, principally because people won't be able to speculate on the price of the coin as much. They'll want to be paid for a service. Okay, uh, quickly, the next question, uh, if I may. Uh, Please, Would please, you make say, it, please make it brief, Arthur, so it, we can go. It will be brief. I'm yeah. sorry. It will be brief. Uh, would, would you say that all, all the, the cryptocurrency, uh, it runs uh, basically on hype? Uh, let's take example, Dogecoin. Uh, Dogecoin has been making very good run just based on Elon Musk's tweets. So would you say it's more hype than actual value? Uh, yeah, well, it, it, this is where we get into it. It's a, it's a great question, Adler, no question, but it's, uh, but it's the, the concept of value. Um, I believe people are looking at getting rich quick. Um, you, you can't do anything with these coins other than you're trading numbers in the dark with each other. That, that's, that's what you're trading. Um, and where I see the value element in it is, you know, can you sell this to other people? It's got no intrinsic value to you. It also applies to, and it, well, it doesn't necessarily oddly apply to fiat currency where you, you know that you'll be taxed. You'll have to keep some of it to one side. But these folks anyway are, are there only because they, they, they want to make money quickly. So the second thing about the value element is, is if you're saying to me, well, I've, I would like to get uh, something that's got some type of intrinsic value you're back into the JP Morgan case. Well, this this number was effectively, it was being given to you, was created with X amount of, of inherent energy. That's fine, but we're, but we're not short of new numbers. Um, and so again, I, I'm still struggling with where people see this value. However, if it's not the get rich quick element of it, there is an argument a bit like this, this argument here that there's some residual cryptocurrency activity that will always continue and that people will therefore use that for diversification. I was by, by moving out into that, I, I might be able to move back in into, into other asset classes. Um, in the same way that somebody who might not be an art lover may never even see a piece of art, but might invest in art and leave it in a warehouse somewhere. Um, and if, from that example, it looks like we might be going into a system of uh, automated execution and algorithmic trading based on Elon Musk's tweets. <laughs> well, with that, I'll, um, next question goes to Gerprit, who had raised yeah. his hand. Yeah, thanks, Diana says, uh, and thanks, uh, Michael, for a wonderful presentation. I think, you know, I do agree with you towards the end. You're, you've noted that um, perhaps the best uh, outcome of all this is the ledger technology and the blockchain technology rather than the cryptocurrencies as such. Uh, but in 2014, um, in the US, IRS um, considered cryptocurrencies as a capital asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence, uh, we are required to report. Uh, but a thought that comes to me is it's so very difficult to track that asset 
and link it to individuals for, for a taxing purpose. Uh, and there are ways of hiding it too, which like any other capital asset can be hidden. Um, so any thoughts on that, if that's a very practical move or, or, or what other countries are thinking about this as well in terms of taxation? Yeah, uh, well, it, the, the honest answer, Gurpreet, is I'm not an expert on it. And I, I've read a lot of this stuff. The, the concept, I, I personally don't think that the U.S. authorities were wrong to tax it as an asset because it is so akin to gold, which they see as the same thing rather than a payment mechanism. It made, it made sense there. I think the second thing is, you know, do you want to be in something which, which has a, a high degree of taxes? And in fact, on my chart, I had taxes as one of the negative points about gold, uh, taxes and premium, because it, 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 it does fall into that. There are other jurisdictions though, that have taken it uh, very, very much to be a medium of exchange. Um, but you do oddly just raise something I, I overlooked, which is of course, that's where central bank digital currencies are not. They won't be treated as an asset. Uh, they will be treated uh, very much under the payment mechanism. Certainly, that's that, that's that's where everybody's headed. So, if it's really a showdown between Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies over anything other than speculation, um, I, I don't think cryptocurrencies have got a leg to stand on. I just have a quick parenthesis here that the the cold storage mechanism, for example, is one of such ways to hide these assets. And our cybercrime teams have certainly got a problem with those. So mm-hmm. the, the new generation of police officers are, are, are being trained to, you know, when they go to asset confiscation, to look for possible USB sticks that hold um, cryptocurrencies and can be very easily transferred from one to the other. Yeah, and we, we haven't come, we haven't spoken about what's happened to Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, current coins. We haven't spoken about uh, where where are the lost coins and how material are they. Um, you know, and Gurpreet is right. You know, it's it's hard to track, but it's not impossible. I mean, Silk Road was definitely caught. You know, once you once you really try and do something with it, it you got to be very very much on your guard. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a, it's a tough spot. And, and there's even a semi-legitimate point, which you know, a lot of people in, in developing or third world countries or dictatorships you know, do feel that this is a way to get money in and out of situations they have without necessarily alerting the authorities. And not, not everything is bad because you're trying to evade authorities. Sometimes you're doing it for legitimate reasons. Um, but we're, we're on to moral discussions, uh, just as Ian uh, you know, has us on to kind of, you know, uh, Scott Scoxic or whatever it's called. Thank you, Michael. Um, gotcha. we've, got, we've got time for one final question. I don't see anyone asking, so I'll open the floor for any final questions. David? Yes, uh, I came to this. I must study what you read more carefully, but I came to this with the uh, burning feeling that cryptocurrencies ultimately were an immoral use of the Earth's resources. Uh, You did briefly sort of dismiss the fact that green energy could be used in other ways. But I wondered if you'd like to sort of boost or not my my sense of outrage about the whole thing. Oh, uh, maybe maybe I was uh, speaking too abruptly. No, uh, my point there was the cryptocurrencies are using energy, full stop. Energy is a fungible market. So the fact that they might be using some green energy for something I see as immoral as you do <laughs> means that they're denying the ability of other people to use that same green mm-hmm. energy for productive purposes. So that, that's how I feel. I, I really meant what I said. I, this is an experiment gone wrong um, or an experiment gone right. It's proven that you can build a consensus, consensus mechanism. But once it got beyond the experimental stage, in my opinion, uh, it didn't serve any particularly useful social purpose. It became a speculative tool. Um, and so uh, I, I'm not anti-speculation in, in the lowercase s sense, which is people going into markets to make them more liquid and, and to arbitrage prices away. But I am against speculation in the sense of directing people towards useless areas. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 we even had the derivative version of it, which is the many sites in China where you would bet on whether Bitcoin would go up or down on the next block. 
um, so it, 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 we, I think we've got bigger problems to solve in the world. Uh, and I think, I know you agree with me, David, uh, and, and those are not uh, consuming huge amounts of energy for a game that isn't really all that fun. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I see also Professor Angel has unmuted his microphone, so I think it would be fair if he has the last word, <laughs> given that as he it, says he's responsible. We have a choice. <laughs> he's responsible you, for both of us. You know, you know, my view is that cryptocurrencies are just going to crash, other than in private groupings, uh, particularly among the super rich, to avoid oversight by national governments. Uh, so, uh, and that could work very easily because the number of transactions involved would be small. Uh, and uh, so, what is your view about the super rich using their own private currencies? Not because public currencies are a problem. Mm. Well, well, the concept of, of a private currency and Bitcoin being sort of a semi-public private, you know, way to transact is one thing. But it's very much about the instantaneity of the transaction. So, you know, yes, I might want to use Bitcoin to move money uh, from Nigeria to London or, or whatever, but do I want to leave it in Bitcoin? Uh, and I think those are two completely different questions. Michael, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll stop here. I know you're very busy and I would really like, like to thank you so much. Uh, we have, I know you use, you use your karmic Korean clapper for your FS club. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have an equivalent to that other than possibly a cup of tea and, <laughs> and a pencil, but that will do. Uh, thank you again so much. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you around in uh, other conferences, events, and I've put the link to the FS Club, prompting uh, all of our participants and our students to join there as well. Yes, uh, it, it is free, by the way. You'd all be welcome. And Dionysus, thank you for throwing me this challenge. It got me thinking, and I was happy uh, to have an opportunity to put my thoughts in order. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, and have a great evening, night, and a great next event. Take care. Michael, you're wonderful.